Alright guys, let's try to think what we're gonna do today. This is vlog day 8, so let's do a reaction video today. Before my phone dies. Ow. Let's do what was hygiene like in the Petunia area days. Just like everyone else, but they often use more than mere soap to get their clothing clean and fresh. For example, oil and grease stains would be combated by rubbing chalk and fabric. Grass and blood stains, on the other hand, would be removed with kerosene, while other miscellaneous odors would be removed using milk. So far, these all sound like life hacks you might find in a modern YouTube video. I didn't know they do that. detergent now. <laughs> Awesome. The earliest indoor toilets, also known as now we have it make a duck, uh, dentist appointments and stuff like they that. They the invention of indoor plumbing, they had some undesirable drawbacks. With no pipes to carry away the waste, it often just dropped into the large cesspool that was located in the building's basement. While this arrangement was more accessible than an outhouse and less exposed than a chamber pot, the cesspool would eventually oh. fill up. Once that happened, it didn't take too long whole house to start smelling, well, like a cesspool. To combat the stank, the cottage industry of night soil then sprung up. These laborers would empty the cesspool. I can't imagine that sounds disgusting. They were known as night soil men. The laws of the era restricted the emptying of would think something as simple as how to take a bath would be pretty intuitive to most people. You sit in water and wash yourself. But in Victorian times, that wasn't common knowledge. In fact, as regular or at least semi-regular bathing came into fashion, Victorians were besieged by publishers selling books that taught the uninitiated what to expect from a bath. Much of this guidance, though, was not huh. scientific. For example, one such book advised the curious and unwashed society to avoid bathing within four hours of eating a large meal. This 
schools still exist today, though it's usually applied to swimming at the campus rather than bathing. Another tip one might find in these books was to avoid washing their face when they traveled, unless they had the means to first purify the water with ammonia or alcohol. So-called Russian baths, which consisted of washing the face with extremely hot and then extremely cold water, were advised for those who were worried about preventing wrinkles. That's how we do it. Me, it's how I take my bath, warm, hot, cold. Today, pretty much everyone is Usually, when it's cold like that, I just take the warm and hot water. So how did one clean their hair back then? Well, women of the era would typically use eggs. One would crack an egg over their head and then move the yolks into their hair, like with a modern shampoo. <coughs> the egg would then be washed out with pitcher of water. Another popular option was vinegar diluted with water. Mmm, that's got to smell morning fresh. Eggs and vinegar weren't the only cooking-related items that made for a popular pre-shampoo hair cleaner. Rum, black tea, and rosemary were all considered normal and effective for hair washing. Uh, they use rum with it. <laughs> cleaning one's hair is important. But that's that's how they did it back then. Many equally important. The Victorians were no different. To that end, all vegetable Sicilian hair ritual, first introduced in the 1860s, became a staple of the era's hair care regimens. The product's main benefit was to darken hair in such a way that allowed people to hide the gray. Unfortunately for the people who used it, Paul's hair maneuver had used lead as a bonding agent. Its function was to aid other chemicals in darkening the hair, but it had the slight side effect of causing lead to Eventually, the company that manufactured Paul's managed to get the lead out, or at least most of it, in the formula, and the product managed to stay on the market well into the 1930s. I thought that's got to hurt. Most people don't like a bad smell, but in Victorian times, bad smells were considered more than just unpleasant. They were believed to be downright dangerous. The idea that various conditions, including cholera and chlamydia, were spread through pollutants in the unclean air was called the miasma theory, or night air, and it dated back to antiquity. Victorians put a lot of stock in the miasma theory and blamed the poor health endemic in London's impoverished districts on wicked smells that floated through the Now these days, even Florence we don't Nightingale, like people who smell like that. <clears throat> believed it, but thought that clean air would restore health to sick patients. While there was a connection between the bad smells and poor health, it wasn't the cost of one Victorian believed. Turns out, the oh, poor sanitation that it's was like... normal in industrial areas at the time was independently causing both the bad smells and many of the diseases. Victorian hygiene obviously had a lot of shortcomings, but it was also one of the first times in history that mainstream society took the time to address the concerns of feminine hygiene. Indeed, both the disposable pad and the earliest versions of the tampon were invented in the late 19th century. These new technologies took some time to become normal and widespread, and in the interim, women of the era got creative. It was discovered that the wood pulp base used to make the bandages typically used for treating wounds of soldiers were also used for menstruation care. On every vacation at a rebel home, there's someone like you who reunited the Ask anyone who lives in New York, London, or Hong Kong, and they'll tell you that in the heat of the summer, big cities, even modern ones, develop a noxious smell. But the stench that emanated from London in 1858 was something else entirely. It was so invariably heinous that the whole city practically shut down. During the Victorian era, the River Thames used to be the hub of the entire London sewage system. In practice, this meant that most citizens disposed of their waste by simply dumping it into the river. Londoners were not happy, and they raised quite a stink over the foul odors that came from the water. Doctors, in accordance with the aforementioned miasma theory, blamed the stench for causing rampant disease throughout the entire city. It was so horrible that the summer of 1858 would forever be known as the Great Stink. That's a t-shirt waiting to happen. <laughs> From bad smells to evil spirits, many strange things were blamed for causing diseases in the past. Among the strangest, though, had to be the Victorian era theory that tuberculosis had its spread was attributable to women's clothing. Jezebel. The era theorized that long skirts dragging along the street were picking up the disease, and women who wore them were unwittingly bringing sickness.
virus into their home and spreading it to their families. The theory didn't stop at dresses, though. The doctors of the time also believed that the tight corsets women wore were also responsible for tuberculosis on account of the fact that they constricted the lungs. As such, doctors yeah, like you put too tight or you close it at the time, you like you can't breathe. Very fashionable. <clears throat> I don't know how I think us women will of course it's they can't breathe in it. Ugh. Sexually transmitted diseases were extremely common at the time, and without regular access to contraceptives, sex workers often transmitted those STDs to their clients. The clients, in turn, would then transmit them to their wives and anyone else they might be involved with. Things got so bad that the spread of sexually transmitted diseases was eventually declared a public health hazard. Laws were passed that allowed escorts to be detained by police and forcibly treated for STDs. Though it wouldn't be widely marketed until 1914, the mouthwash we know as Listerine was invented by Dr. George Lawrence and chemist turned entrepreneur George Wheat Lambert in 1879. Victorians were slowly beginning to accept notions of modern hygiene, so Lambert first tried marketing his concoction as a medical antiseptic. For whatever reason, the product was overlooked and failed to turn a profit for its creators. Not one to give up easily, Lambert began to suggest additional, and often unusual, uses for Listerine. Before he finally hit on selling it as a mouthwash, he tried marketing it as everything from a floor cleaner to a cure for dandruff and gonorrhea. So what do you think? Would mm. you have enjoyed living in the Victorian era? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from our week. Alright, <clears throat> right, guys, I will see you in my uh, second video, so let's see you then.